I'm joined today by Dr. Matthew Harris. Matthew is a clinical senior lecturer in public health in the Department of Primary Care and Public Health at Imperial College London, and is an honorary consultant in public health medicine for the Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. His research spans global health, innovation diffusion, primary care and health services. And prior to joining Imperial College London, Matthew worked for several years as a primary care physician in Brazil, a WHO polio consultant in Ethiopia, an HIV technical consultant in Mozambique, and a global health advisor to the UK Department of Health. In this episode of Tuning Healthcare, Matthew and I discuss frugal innovation and reverse innovation, and how can we do more with less? How we can learn from developing countries about public and private healthcare partnerships. How the UK is adopting a Brazilian model of care using community healthcare workers, and how COVID has driven a greater need for us to focus on these topics. Join Matthew and me as we tune healthcare. Great, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us today. This is truly an honor for me, um, and perhaps an honor with you as opposed to OR. Um, this is a number of firsts, right? The first time we're hosting an international guest on the podcast. Um, so I think we're really excited to hear your perspectives about the UK health system and perhaps some of the things that we can learn here in the US from, from your experience and from your research. And uh, secondly, this is the first time I'm hosting somebody who I went to school with. And so we were just chatting as we get, I think it was 41 odd years ago that we first met, which makes, uh, makes both of us feel rather old, but um, you know, absolute delight to, um, to have you on the podcast. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Nigel. It's wonderful to see you again. It's been too long. Yeah, way too long. So you have an amazing story, um, both as a physician, you've worked all over the world. Um, now you uh, are having a significant impact um, through research being sort of the primary method that you're utilizing to, to try and impact change in the, in the US healthcare system. Tell us a little bit about your background and your career um, and the, why you made the choices that, that you have. Thank you, Nigel. So um, I, the first thing to say is I'd love to make an impact in the US health system, but really it's the UK health system. Oh, sorry, sorry, did I say the US? Sorry, my apologies, <laughs> UK health system. Well, maybe after this podcast, you're, you're making an impact in the US as well. Who knows, let's think big. Um, no, so I, I, I've had a bit of a, um, I suppose, a, uh, a circuitous trajectory. I, I, be, I began um, studying medicine at uh, University College London back in the, uh, in the 90s. And uh, so therefore qualified in medicine, became a doctor, I worked in the UK for a little bit doing junior house officer jobs. I think you might call them residencies in the US. Um, before then, uh, for one reason or another, moving to Brazil, um, and retraining in medicine there. I, I took all my, my medical school exams in Portuguese and, and requalified as a doctor in order to work as a general practitioner in their primary care system. So I found myself, I ended up in Recife, which is in the northeast of Brazil, in a state called Pernambuco. And I was a single-handed general practitioner in a tiny little clinic in a rural area, very impoverished, looking after around 5,000 people in a, in a community there. Um, and I was there for about four years before then coming back to the UK and doing my master's in public health at London School of Hygiene. Um, and then working for the WHO um, on polio eradication programs in, in uh, northern Ethiopia. I spent a little bit of time there doing a lot of outreach work on cold chain support and uh, outreach and training healthcare workers on uh, immunization campaigns such as for measles and polio and other things like that. And then I moved to Mozambique and I worked in uh, central Mozambique, a town called Shimoyo, where I was running an HIV hospital there for a, for a little under a year um, before, before then coming back to the UK, doing my, my doctorate in public health at Oxford University and then training to become a consultant in public health medicine in our NHS, our, our, our health system here in the UK. So I'm currently a, what we call a clinical senior lecturer in public health medicine at Imperial College. Um, so I'm essentially a, a clinical academic in public health. Uh, that means I, what do I do? I, I'm a director of the Masters in Public Health program. 
I do research into innovation diffusion in healthcare. I have a particular interest in looking at frugal innovations from low income countries and how we might adopt them in the UK and some of the barriers and challenges to doing so. Um, so my work really tries to bridge that, I suppose, divide between research and practice by looking for solutions that clinicians can be thinking about adopting and studying those processes of, of adoption as well. That's it in a nutshell. It, and, and a little bit more than a nutshell, it's, um, it's really an incredible journey um, and uh, experiences that um, obviously are truly amazing. Um, and the, um, the breadth I'd imagine you bring to your, your work is, is, is a result of obviously a lot, a lot of the things that you've experienced. One of the things that has struck me from reading um, I can't say I've written or read all 100 things that you, 100 plus things that you've had published, but I've I read a few. But one of the things that did strike me is that um, you seem to approach everything from a very practical perspective, right? Rather than just sort of living in academia and, and you know, um, uh, you know, you went to Oxford, I went to Cambridge. The, um, the, in, the people I interacted there lived in academia, right? They... They want, it was an academic exercise rather than a practical exercise. But one of the things that really struck me about your work is that you're really trying to drive practical implications and what are the consequences and what can people do as a result of, of the, um, the work you've done. And so, that's, that's, and so as, we, as we go through this, it's gonna be fascinating, I think, to, to learn about how, how you've looked and hope the UK will apply them and maybe some of the lessons that we can learn in the US. So going back to the time when we were in school together, uh, a school called Haberdashers, um, did, you, did you know then you wanted to be a doctor? You know, I did actually. Um, the problem is I didn't know what it meant to be a doctor. So <laughs> I had a sense of it. I had a sense, you know, it sounded good. It was um, definitely, I was interested in the sciences, biology, human body, I remember at a very early age, it's embarrassing to say it, but I was reading Grey's Anatomy from the age of 10. I, don't ask me why, I just, maybe I like the pictures. Um, it was something and I, I just got into it and I was always really interested in the body and how it worked. And, um, and I think we were probably at the kind of school, I don't know if you, you had this experience yourself, but we were kind of at the, at the, the, at the kind of school that really funneled you, I think. You know, if you, if you were reasonably academic, then you would go into medicine. <laughs> you know, it was as simple as that. And so I, I, there was a little bit of funneling there, I won't lie, um, but I was still nonetheless very interested in, in, in medicine and the caring profession and, every, and everything else that's, that came along with it. So I was very happy to study medicine. The problem really began when I realized that that meant you had to also be a doctor. <laughs> and, when, when, and I actually struggled, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I struggled when, uh, when I qualified as, as an actual clinician. And it hadn't really dawned on me just how, you know, well, I suppose the stresses and the strains of clinical practice and death and dying and all those sorts of things were really, I, it took, took a bit of a toll. And they don't teach you that at medical school. They certainly didn't signal it at school that these were the sorts of things you'd have to really be grappling with. So, so when I entered the NHS as a junior doctor with, for the first time, real responsibility for looking after patients and everything that comes along with it, I actually found that I didn't cope particularly well with that. Um, I didn't have a particularly supportive team around me. So that also was a bit of an exacerbating factor perhaps. But one of the things that I grappled with most, in addition to the struggles of working in a healthcare system, was that I was continuously thinking about the big picture, the bigger picture. You know, not how do we treat this person the best way we possibly can, but why is this person even here in the first place? What are the failings in terms of society at large, in terms of the choices they've made, in terms of the choice architecture that's available to them? You know, if they smoke, why are they smoking? Um, rather than how do we treat this lung cancer? So, so I was always from an early age more, more along the lines of thinking about the bigger picture. And I certainly found myself grappling with those sorts of questions as a clinician, which, which isn't particularly helpful when you're dealing with the day-to-day -day, um, issues around patient care, because of course, you know, those bigger questions, those are questions of public health, um, social determinants of health, we call it, of course, and the, the things that lead people to require care in the first place. And I found myself grappling a lot with the inefficiencies in the system. 
you know, the craziness of, 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 of the fact that we've got in the NHS no less than 100,000 different IT systems operating. Sometimes wards within the same hospital have different IT systems. These things, inefficiencies that just, you know, annoyed me, <laughs> to, put, to, 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 to put it pretty frankly. And right. so I found myself, therefore, just going more in the direction of, of these bigger questions. How do we improve the system that the clinicians are working in? How do, we, how do we improve society at large or identify the issues in society at large to ensure that people don't need care in the first place? How do we reorganize care in such a way that it costs less, that it, um, that it does, does a, a better service than the one which we're providing? So in a way, whilst I trained as a doctor and I'm always very grateful to have had that experience, um, one of the driving underpinning um, drivers for me has always been about addressing the bigger picture than the clinic. Right. Yeah, that, that, that's great. And obviously it helps explain the transition from clinical practice to, to sort of clinical research. Um, so in, in 2018, you wrote an article that I thought was, um, was really interesting. Um, the, the one from Malawi to Middlesex. Um, the case for the Arbus's drill cover system, right? And, and so what's fascinating to me is less the drill system itself, um, because uh, that obviously was, I mean, the gist of the article, I think, was MSK is a huge burden, not just on the NHS, but in the US health system as well. A lot of interesting companies that are that are trying to address that um, from a overall care perspective. But you were, you were focusing here on 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 just a particular piece of surgery and how this um you know this this particular arbiter's drill cover system is 94 percent i think cheaper it was than the um than the standard surgical drill available in the uk and so i think that's you know what is to me at least what was fascinating about 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 that article and and a number of other articles you were you wrote about and you've written about is this whole concept of frugal innovation um, so first of all, define for us what that means, because I really do believe in the U.S. health system. Um, it's a term that we don't hear often, but I, I actually think is a term that might be surprising to uh, many people that live and breathe in, in the U.S. health system, which is, you know, uh, a costly health system and a lot of expense is, is, spare, is, is, is placed and little is spared. Thanks, Nigel. I mean, it's a really good question, and there's, a, I suppose, quite a lot in that. Um, the part, part of the perhaps reason why you haven't heard a lot about frugal innovation in the, in the US is, is, is the term frugal innovation itself. You know, the, the very connotation that frugality might give to people is, is not entirely a positive one. Um, you know, it, it often evokes what an image of being sort of cheaper and therefore yeah, missing out. Missing yeah, exactly. Less effective, maybe lower quality, and so forth. And and it it actually couldn't be further from the truth. The frugal innovation is one that is as good as the existing innovation. If you're comparing technologies, for example, sometimes even better at delivering the outcomes that you expect it to deliver, that you it intends to deliver, um, but just at a far far lower cost. And it achieves that through a number of mechanisms, through sort of simplification of the technology, through repurposing technology from one, one domain into another. So the technology already exists, you're just giving it, using it for a different reason, uh, through ensuring that the materials used are sourced sustainably or locally, through making the innovation perhaps light, more lightweight or more rugged. Um, removing some of the complicated features that might make it more sophisticated, but aren't necessarily needed in order to deliver the, its function. So one of the things we often see in healthcare innovation is something that's called sustaining innovation. It's in, in little improvements on the technology that aren't actually necessary, but make it more attractive to the market. Um, and, and also increase the cost. Frugal innovation kind of does the opposite. It removes the things that aren't really necessary. They're a bit superfluous and strips the innovation back down to its barest bones without scrimping on the, the, the function that it requires. So the case of the Arbutus drill is a really interesting one. Uh, just to put some flesh on the bones, the, the drills that we use in orthopedic surgery, at least here in the UK, are fantastically expensive. They're about 30,000 pounds each. 
Um, and they're expensive because they're encased in a sophisticated sort of stainless steel encasing that allows them to be autoclaved and therefore made sterile for use within the operating theatre. But in Malawi and in uh, Uganda and Kenya and other places where the drills uh, aren't pr procurable because of the resource uh, restrictions and limitations, they innovated in a different way, which was frugally, which was to take a regular hardware drill the kind that you would use to put up your shelves at home or, or, or some, something similar, and which on its own wouldn't be suitable for an orthopedic operation, obviously. Um, but put, it, put the drill, the hardware drill, inside a sterile bag. And you know, the concept of therefore using an ordinary hardware drill inside a sterile bag, making therefore the drill system suitable for an operation, um, is so simple and, and, and so, so much cheaper that actually it becomes really an interesting and viable alternative. And, and that particular technology has been used hundreds of thousands of times in sub-Saharan Africa with absolutely no demonstrable increase in post-operative infections, which would be your main concern, of course, in using a hardware drill. So the issue there, that, which, which leads to the second interesting point is yes, in and of itself, it's a really interesting alternative to the sophisticated technologies, but can it be used in the UK? And some of the, and elsewhere, in fact, in high income settings. And um, it has, in fact, been used as a, as a bit of a world first, if you like, in a hospital, hospital in Baltimore, um, in a, a trauma hospital called Shock Trauma uh, Hospital. Uh, it's been used for spinal traction. Um, and we've not noticed, as, as part of the evaluation that we did with colleagues there, any increase at all in post-operative infection rates, which goes to show that it's the sort of technology that could be used in even in a high income setting as well, which of course, why wouldn't it be able to be used in a high income country setting? There's no you know, intrinsic difference between the patients there and the patients in Malawi. So the question is, I suppose, around how do we reframe what we, what we're, what's palatable as well in terms of what we use clinically? It might not look sophisticated, it might not cost a lot, uh, but it does what it says on the tin um, and, do and doesn't scrimp and doesn't compromise patient safety. And so the kind of savings that would, you could anticipate from using innovation like that in, in the high income setting is really, really interesting. We calculated in the UK that if we swapped out all of the existing drills with that technology in the UK over overnight, which of course, you know, it's a hypothetical scenario, we would save something like a hundred million pounds just by swapping out the technology. Right. It's crazy. So, you know, it's a really wow. interesting policy alternative. Yeah. Right. So is the, is the largest barrier that you come across to, to frugal innovation in the UK, the physician community or the executives of, um, of healthcare trusts who are resistant to doing anything that might upset their physicians? It's a really good question. Look, we, we already know from the literature that adopting an innovation is one of the hardest things you can do in healthcare because it requires a change in behavior, right? You need to stop doing what you're currently doing, which you're doing for all sorts of reasons and relearn your practice and use something else. So it's very, very difficult. There's lots of inertia with any kind of innovation. But when with an innovation like a frugal innovation, which on its own confers all sorts of different constraints because people don't immediately like the idea of it for all sorts of reasons plus coupled with the fact that it's come they tend to be coming from 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 contexts shall we say that, that we're not we don't typically associate with innovative practice such as sub-saharan africa and other low-income countries that's where frugal innovations are most often found born out of necessity most often Right. But but for both of those reasons, it makes it really challenging. In addition to the, the inertia you'd expect anyway with innovation adoption, it makes it really challenging to adopt these sorts of innovations because you've got to battle all sorts of different, on, on different fronts, right? Your perception of the country where the innovation came from, the perception of the innovation itself being frugal and not quite so sexy as the ones you're already using, and the idea, of course, of actually having to change your practice. So clinicians obviously are going to be central to that. And it's a shame because, you know, they're gay. No tickets to the to a football match from the manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it tends not to come with those sorts of perks. So, <laughs> you're, but you're absolutely right. You know, those sorts of mechanisms to sort of get, get these innovations into practice are really, you know, that's not going to happen with these sorts of things. And so the work we do 
is to serve as sort of intermediaries to sort of re really sort of be persuasive around the, 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 the business case, if you like, for using these innovations and work with clinicians closely to try and, uh, if you like, change hearts and minds around their use. There's another obviously very difficult issue, which is around the regulatory barriers. You know, these sorts of technologies are very rarely patented. They very rarely have any sort of commercial backing or an enterprise behind them that can promote them and enter into new markets. So, you, you know, we have to sort of do all of that work for them, if you like. And so, so that's a really practical barrier that's a difficult one to overcome. Yeah. So another reason I find this topic fascinating is because at Lumeris, in effect, we are also a part of what we do in the business of physician behavior change. Um, you know, trying to get physicians to change the way they behave from a fee-for-service system to managing populations and even little things like outreach to, to patients to bring them in proactively rather than sort of cafeteria style, seeing who, who comes in is, is sometimes for some practices a monumental change. And, and getting them just to do that is, is, is sometimes uh, takes an enormous amount of, of time and effort. And so um, the, what your research illustrates is that there's so much room for, for, for realistic cost savings that don't impact quality. And, and obviously, you know, going beyond that, there's, as, you, as you delve into some of the other innovation, there's opportunities to improve quality. And so that sort of ties into sort of the second topic of your research that I find fascinating. It's obviously really tightly linked to frugal innovation is reverse innovation. Um, right. I'm not, I'm not, I must admit, I'm not entirely sure of the, of the, of the difference. I assume that I, my assumption of the difference is reverse is could be, doesn't necessarily be frugal. It's just innovation that comes from, um, you know, from a, sort of less developed country as opposed to, um, into the more developed country where historically, right, most innovation has come from developed countries and then applied to, to, um, to less developed countries. Um, so is that the distinction between frugal and reverse? Um, but tell us a little bit um, about some of the research you've done into reverse innovation and, and I, again, a little bit the sort of the bias you've come across as you've, uh, as you've tried to, to, to do that. Yeah, thanks. So you're absolutely right. So in terms of the difference between reverse and frugal, um, although reverse innovations tend to be frugal because they're coming from low income countries, but they don't have to be. And right. a frugal innovation doesn't have to be a reverse innovation because unless it's adopted into a high income setting, it won't it wouldn't be called a reverse innovation. Well, I maybe say, I could have done the academic path at Habs after all. They, they, they <laughs> pushed you to medicine. They pushed me to sport. <laughs> well, maybe I should have gone into, into that. <laughs> But the um, but um, it, it's a it's a really interesting area. And I mean, the first thing to say is I don't like the term reverse innovation. It has all sorts of connotations as well, because it really reinforces this idea that innovation flows in one direction. So that's from high to low income countries, expertise, technical know how everything else goes from rich to poor. Uh, and when that happens in the other direction, then that's in reverse. And so in some senses, it's, it's an unfortunate terminology because it kind of reinforces the very thing it's trying to... Right. Well, it's degrading from, from the very beginning. Yeah, exactly. You know, you might say it's a bit like, it's an oxymoron, perhaps. It's a, like a patient-centered care is, is a bit like that, right? Because if it, if it really was patient-centered, then you'd be calling it person-centered care. Patient-centered care is really doctor-centered because you're yeah. calling the patient. So it's there, we could, we could spend a long time there. You're hitting a topic that I'm passionate about. We, we have physician centric care in the U S and, and yeah. it's, it's about time we had truly, as you say, person centric care, but anyway, care, we'll, we can, we can come back to that if we have time. Oh, well, that'd be fascinating. I'm sure. But mm -hmm. the, you know, I, again, you know, it, it sort of it sort of touches a lot on how the health systems are structured, of course, and and it's difficult to compare between the UK and US because our systems are really so different. But you know, you, you in the US, of course, you have a market based system where costs are really someone's income, actually. You know, so it's um, it's very difficult to think about reducing costs to some extent in the US when that is, in some senses, so closely linked to the income of a clinician. But that's that that's uh, related to this idea of frugal innovation, of course, because who's in whose interests is it to actually adopt a, a technology that actually saves money? It might not be at all in the interest of a clinician to do that. 
um, in the US at least. Whereas in the UK, because we have a single payer system, any, any efforts to reduce overall costs in terms of procuring technology is going to be reason, at least from you know, the first principles, a good idea. But the reverse innovation piece is interesting because it really taps into this sort of what legacy effect that we might we might say this sort of historical effect of development assistance and almost colonialism actually as well that has really um, what's been the signature if you like and the defining characteristic of much of our overseas development and aid policies it's difficult to separate the history of post-colonialism from the work that governments do overseas through either directly through bilateral assistance or indirectly through supporting international non-governmental development organizations. I mean, there's been a sea change shift in, in, in some of those approaches, being more participatory um, and so forth. And the way aid is delivered is certainly improving, much more recognition of the importance of mutual benefit in the delivery of international health partnerships and reciprocity. But reverse innovation takes much more of a direct approach. It's, it's about specifically looking for innovations from low income countries that do more with less uh, without scrimping on quality and seeing how we can directly implement them into the UK. Um, sorry, would you? No, no, carry on. Yeah, so <laughs> but what, one of the, you touched on one of the research papers we've written about, um, which I think was the one you're referring to was one around cognitive biases. And essentially what that did was to, to essentially look at, well, what, what, what is one of the main challenges around reverse innovation? Do we treat innovations from low income countries palpably different to innovations from high income countries? What might be some of the reasons why? Um, so what we did was a, was a research study that essentially randomized research abstracts to English clinicians and asked them to rate those abstracts against a couple of criteria. What was the strength of the evidence in the abstract? How relevant was it to their clinical practice? And would they recommend that abstract to appear? But when we asked them to rate it a second time a month later, changing the source from a rich country to a poor country, under these controlled conditions, we found that actually they, their views of the, the research just radically changed. They were just much, much worse. They rated on all, all measures much, much worse which we think is a real challenge when it comes to reverse innovation, because whilst we were looking at research abstracts in this instance, you could swap that out for an innovation, a healthcare technology of any sort, and you'd probably get exactly the same effect. When you, when you, think, when you think of an innovation coming from, and no disrespect to these countries, but when you think of an innovation coming from Malawi, Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, when you're sitting in the UK and you're thinking of innovations coming from those settings, you're immediately, and it's unfortunate, but you're immediately going to view those in a certain way. Whereas when you think of an innovation from the US or from Canada, from Germany or Switzerland, you'll have the opposite effect. And that's really because of this sort of legacy effect that we have, the way those countries are stereotyped or represented in the media, it filters through into our unconscious and we reach snap judgments about those innovations very, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so, when it comes to reverse innovation, when we're talking about adopting innovations, frugal innovations from those settings that are perceived rightly or wrongly to be very different to our settings here in the UK or in the US, that becomes a real issue. It's how do you then um, address those cognitive biases head on by neutralizing the effect of what we call the country of origin effect so that those cognitive biases are minimized as much as possible. And you're just looking at the innovation itself and it's and base and, and reach a judgment based on its merits alone yeah uh, so fascinating because obviously bias has um exists in in every sphere of life um and the whole concept if you like of innovation even if you take it out of, of sort of reverse innovation it's often a smaller cheaper you know skunk works company who who eventually grows to to unseat a, a giant because it's because innovation happens often, right? In a in a in a very sort of um, you know low income way, right? That's how a lot of innovation happens, right? Um, and so the so the concept should really apply equally, right? Just because it was it was born in a in a cheap garage, right? everyone loves the garage story in Silicon Valley, right? Um, it was it's not it's not someone spending at least initially spending millions and millions of dollars on that innovation, right? And everyone loves the garage story in Silicon Valley, but the garage story, as you say, in Mozambique doesn't, 
dozen of bills. So, so practically, if the UK adopted any of the suggestions that you've put out to to try and remove some of this bias and to to advance some of these, uh, for want of a better term, uh, reverse innovation. Yeah, you know, we're beginning to see some some shifts in narrative, and we're beginning to see some shifts in practice as well. Right. So COVID, you know, we can't have this conversation without mentioning COVID once at least has been has been a real, I think, disruptor to a large extent, because what we've and we've published on this as well. We had a piece out in Nature Medicine last year talking about frugal innovation responses in the context of COVID. Yeah, I read it. It was so great. Article. Ideas of sort of frugal, um, frugal ventilator machines using off the parts, you know, off, off the shelf rather parts from other other technologies or um, you know, proning patients rather than using ventilation, you know, so you don't have to rely on technology. Simple, simple shifts right. in clinical practice at low cost. Um, and much of these ideas actually came from low income countries. And so it's not, COVID has been a real, um, if you like, disruption in terms of us beginning to realize in the UK, at least, that we should be looking to some of those settings. We continue to bang that drum. That being said, at a policy level, we would only hear of the US and Germany and France, you know, you'd never really hear in the press about what was going on in other parts of the world. And so there's still a lot of work to be done about homogenizing the influences that we have within our societies at least. But I think, I think what it's also done is shown that we have a pressing need here in the UK at least now that, that we never really fully appreciated before. That COVID has cost us a lot of money Right. We've been borrowing a ridic ridiculous amount. Our health system has exhibited all sorts of fragilities that we'd never really fully appreciated before. The public health response was slow um, and left wanting to a large extent. And so there's, whilst there's been some hubris to some extent and some British, good old British exceptionalism, um, I also find that there's been a little bit of a shift in narrative. So a good example of that is um, the frugal innovation that I've been talking about for many, many years because I had personal experience of it, not, not, not least, but was the Brazilian primary care system. As I mentioned at the beginning, I worked there for several years. And, the, and what makes that a very interesting system is that they use community health workers to um, reach out into every household um, that they're responsible for, irrespective of need or expressed demand. So these are monthly visits, at least as a minimum, to at least 150, 150 to 200 households per community health worker. And the community health worker is integrated into primary care as well. So they're part of the team. And by doing that outreach work on a proactive basis, they can identify um, all sorts of health and social care needs before they become major issues and before they require health care. And it's that proactive approach, that universal approach across the life course that has shown some extraordinary outcomes in Brazil in recent years, pre-COVID at least, where they've seen a decrease in 30% of um, mortality for cardiovascular disease mortality in areas where this sort of primary care system has had, had a high penetrance. So this month, in fact, whilst it's taken many, many years to get it off the ground, we're piloting the same sort of approach on using community health workers in a local authority in a borough in London called Westminster. Um, and in order to see whether or not this sort of proactive universal outreach approach using lay community health workers is going to be as effective as we see in Brazil. And we're already seeing good signs that it's scaling into other regions around the country. So it's a really exciting moment for people interested in reverse innovation to see uh, a primary care system from a low middle income country in the case of Brazil being explicitly drawn upon uh, to, to draw some learnings from there and actually change practice here in the UK as well. Yeah, so, so that's fascinating. I'd love to delve a little bit more into, into sort of this concept, right? I so I think you wrote the article, at least the one I read was back in 2011, um, about your, your experience in Brazil and sort of the integration of public health and, and, and sort of primary care, which, um, as you have um, sort of correctly articulated, the pandemic has illustrated, you know, like, we need that more than ever, right? The public health, um, you know, clearly in many countries around the world was was left wanting um, and primary care um, you know runs in a completely siloed fashion um, to to um, to anything that was done from a public health perspective and so 
so community health workers let's um let's delve into that into into a little bit more detail tell us a little bit what does the profile look like of a community health worker and and sort of how many, based on your research, I, I've, I've, again, I know you've, you've put some, some numbers out there in your research, but share for us, how many would you need, do you think about it per practice? Do you think about it, do you think about it per number of patients? Um, what is the sort of geographical area? How often do they visit? Put a bit of, as you say, put a little bit of meat on the bones for us as what, what is a community health worker in, as you think about it? Well, we, we, we try to adhere very closely to the, the model that was used in Brazil because there it's been in, in, in place now for 30 years. They've, it's been scaled throughout the entire country. This model serves 70% of the population um, across 95% of its territory, right? So imagine a country the size of Brazil. It's actually the largest primary care system on the planet. Um, and it's all government funded, all free at point of use taxpayer funded um, and very much centered on the core principles of primary care around un universality and comprehensiveness. Um, in, in terms of what they do and who they are, the community health workers essentially, there's usually between four and six per GP practice. Each community health worker will have between 150 and 200 households of their own. They will be in a defined geographical area with no overlaps or gaps between their territory, if you like, and their other community health workers territory that's affiliated to the same practice. So it's fully universal um, and it's fully comprehensive. So essentially what that means is the community health worker visiting at least once a month, all of the households in their territory, but they'll be trained to deliver at a very low technical level, but nonetheless, um, in, to be useful, if you like, across a wide array of different clinical areas from, from infancy all the way through to care of the elderly. So they would be as interested and concerned with whether or not a child under, the under five has had all their immunizations, whether the mother has had her cervical smear, whether the father is exhibiting symptoms and signs of hypertension or diabetes, whether someone smokes or doesn't, whether they, uh, an adolescent you know, has, might have concerns around sexual health or drug use, um, all the way through to social isolation and loneliness. And all of those things can be happening all the time in their patch of 150 to 200 households, right? So by being able to, by not being constrained clinically or in, in a typical vertical way that we often have in the UK and the US, I'm sure as well, where you're focused on specific clinical areas like improving diabetes care exclusively or something. It's the opposite. The, the community health workers are fully comprehensive. They, they look at the household as a whole and everything in it. And then they also look at the community as a whole and how the household fits in within the community. And what can they be doing to leverage assets within the community to improve health and social care in that geography? So it's essentially, the model, what that does is it essentially makes, prime, it, it, it um, merges what is otherwise a pretty arbitrary distinction between primary care and public health. Primary care is public health in Brazil, right? They have as much responsibility for individual clinical care, uh, ambulatory care, just as, as you might see in, in the US or UK, as they do for looking out for the needs for the entire population that they're responsible for and identifying the kind of opportunities to improve healthcare at a community level, not just waiting for people to come through the door. So it's population health, uh, but it's the responsibility yeah, of the public care team. And so is the community health worker then identifies a, 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 an area of concern. So we could pick anyone. Let's say they, they, they visit and they, and they realize that the grandfather, um, you know, recently fell and they're concerned about, about uh, that he hasn't been fully checked out. And, and as we know, fall in the elderly is, uh, is often the precipice for many, um, many complications. So, he, so the community health worker thankfully visits and it's two days after, after, after grandpa fell. Um, They've never, they haven't done anything about it. They're just, as far as they can tell, it's just, um, you know, a bruise and, and, um, and they're treating it at home. Does the community health worker then contact the primary care physician? Does the community health worker encourage the, the patient to go be seen? What are, what are the responsibilities at that point of the community health worker? Um, and how does that then tie into sort of that continuation of care? 
So it's a really good question um, and it's a good example actually, because I would say that they would probably have identified the fool's risk in the first place to avoid the the, the grandfather actually falling over in the first right. place. Even better, right? <laughs> Even better. Right. But, but, but you're right, if that fall had happened, um, the other important thing to mention is they're not clinicians, right? So they can't diagnose in that sense, right? They wouldn't, that, 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 that's way outside of their remit. But what they are able to do is, be, is because they would intimately know the family through building up that trust and that relationship, getting to know them over many, many visits, over many months and years, they know when something's wrong, right? They know when that person's behavior is slightly off. They'll know if, um, you know, someone's not quite telling the truth or whatever, you know, they're hiding something. They just know them intimately. They just know the families intimately because they build that trust, they build that relationship. So even though they might not be able to clinically diagnose, they'll have a high degree of suspicion when something's wrong, not quite right. And it's that, uh, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, but really what the community health workers are about is emotional intelligence. It's that idea that they just can pick up on things through a trusting and quite frankly, loving relationship with the households that they're responsible for. And when there's a need, therefore, they'll absolutely signpost into the primary care physician who would be in a position to be able to affect any sort of clinical care as needed. So essentially what they are is they're the ears and eyes of the primary care yeah, team in the right. community where GPs no longer have time to be going on home visits and dealing with things in the community. And they therefore don't know the community or their households that they're responsible for very well. The community health worker does that job for them. And so it's their early warning system. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and as we know, in the follow up aftercare, the, the situation that you have at home significantly impacts how you, how you deal with aftercare, right. In terms of even just taking medication, which is, um, you know, low hanging fruit. Um, and then is the concept that the community health worker, is it best to think of that as a social worker being the, the best qualification for that? What is, what's your thoughts on, on what, what, what is the, the, the person who does that role look like? So um, I th they, they can definitely come from a social work background. They can come from, um, in the UK, the ones that we've recruited um, in this pilot, um, they, they, they're what's called community champions. So these are people who you know, passionate about their community, uh, have been working as volunteers perhaps in a particular area, but wanna take it to the next level. Because this is a paid role, full-time, 40 hours a week, um, and a professional role, quite frankly, but they're not healthcare professionals. They wear, they wear, if you like, two hats. They're part of the team, but they're also part of the community. And they, they have to navigate that joint, that, that dual dynamic quite carefully. So definitely there's a lot of social work involved in the role, but there's also a lot of community engagement. There's a lot of participatory methods. There's a lot of clinical care to some extent, a very low technical level around giving advice on healthcare issues, screening, immunizations, and, other, and, and health promotion and lifestyle advice. It's actually an intervention that's quite difficult to pigeonhole. And it's something we struggled with in the UK, getting this off the ground is, well, who owns it? Is it a primary care service? Is it a public health service? Is it a social care service? Is it a community action service? What is it? Who owns it? Where's the funding gonna come from? Because the truth is, it's the kind of intervention that will impact on all of those domains across the ecosystem. It impacts on primary care, it impacts on public health, it impacts on social care to, to greater or lesser degrees. And so one of the ways to get it off the ground is to have uh, if you like a convening of, of representation of all of the different elements of the ecosystem to get involved, to get skin in the game and to understand how it will benefit everything that they do as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. So I'm gonna watch with great interest to see how the pilot goes. I hope you'll send me results because uh, I, I think it's um, definitely something that we could integrate into um, into our health system here and something that that's clearly needed interesting enough and and we don't have time to delve into it in more detail there are some ethnic communities in the us that don't have exactly the same but have sort of these intermediaries that help them because they they either language barrier or cultural barrier makes it hard for them to to seek care and access care they some communities have built sort of these intermediaries that that help them find the right doctor, find the specialist. And, and so some communities have built have by necessity again, you know, we're back to sort of, um, you know, necessity driving innovation. Um, the have built something that's a little bit similar, but not exactly the same. 
uh, but it, uh, as I said, I'm going to keep an eye on 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 your pilot, and 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 maybe we can bring something similar to the to the UK. Matthew, I could keep chatting to you for hours uh, about lots of different topics. Um, as we said, your fast your your background's fascinating. Your experience is is um, is is really intriguing. Uh, but we like to end with what we call the the quick fire round. Um, and so um, these are four quick questions that we ask every guest we have. And it's, uh, I think people find it interesting to, to hear what, what different people um, say. So first, <coughs> what's, the, um, what's the best piece of advice you were ever given? That's a really, really good one. So I, uh, I would say that pretty much anything that my wife says to me on any given day uh, <laughs> is, is probably the best advice I, I, I'm given. But, but more specifically, I think it was probably when I was deciding to go to Brazil back at the end when I of medical school and I was actually going to quit medicine and not finish my medical training. The best piece of advice I was given at that point was to continue. Uh, and it was hard, and I, but I got through it. But had I not continued, then I wouldn't actually be able to do what I'm doing today. So uh, that, that was actually a good piece of advice. Yeah, so persevere. Um, and what do you do um, to relax, have fun when you're not uh, trying to fix the UK health system? <laughs> not much time to <laughs> left over. But uh, look, I've got two. I've got two kids, so that takes up a lot of time. But I've recently taken up the drums, and uh, I have uh, really been enjoying just banging and crashing uh, on the drums. Um, hopefully, you've got a, hopefully you've got a soundproof room to, to avoid the rest of the family suffering. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self? So that was an intriguing question. I think what I would say is take more photos hmm. of, of everything that you're doing um, because I never did. And it's getting harder and harder to remember all the good times. So, <laughs> okay. so I probably would take more photos. Yeah. You, if you had married an American like I did, they, we take photos all the time. Um, but, uh, and then finally, if you could change one thing about healthcare, what would it be? Well, it's diff a difficult question because, of course, healthcare is different everywhere. But I think one thing I'd probably change is how we train doctors um, that go into healthcare, because I think it drives a lot of the fundamental problems that we have in, around the world. I would... Um, I would work on fixing this idea that we should all become specialists in something. Um, we, we, we first should be generalists and then develop specialisms thereafter. It feels that the, the rush to become specialists is unhelpful. Man, that's, uh, that's very interesting. And I'm, I'm sure we could talk for a lot longer on just that topic alone. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. It's, as I said at the outset, an honor for me to have you um, the longest, uh, longest person I've known ever on, on a podcast. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all your insights. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, let's not wait another 41 years to see each other again. Thank mm. you for the invite. It's been really fun. Thank you for joining us today. Please follow us on your favorite streamer and don't forget to rate us as it helps others find our podcast. Please join us again next time as we tune healthcare. This is Nigel Orenstein in New York. 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 Orenstein in